Welcome everyone to the Educational Resource Center's workshop on memory and learning. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how memory works and what strategies you can use to make your studying more effective. Um, so basically how, how memory relates to studying smarter, not necessarily harder. And here to help me talk about that is my colleague, Professor Michael Grant, and he'll take the first part of this workshop. Thank you, Cecilia. Hello, thanks again for coming. We're going to start off by doing a little theory. Uh, this is going to be a little bit like a lecture, so I apologize ahead, ahead of time for that. But some of the strategies we'll be talking about today are grounded in theory, and we know what memory, how memory relates to learning, the learning process. So I want to give you a little background uh, to, to convince you that these strategies we'll, we'll be talking about work and will make you a better, a better student and get better grades. Hopefully. So a simple definition, what is learning? Relatively durable change in knowledge due to experience. So if we think about that just in an academic setting, you know, the durable, I, I underline durable for a reason. We want long term. We want you to be able to study over time to the point where when it's time to take a test, you can recall that knowledge because you've put it into long term memory. All right? The experience obviously is an academic setting. Whether you're in a classroom hearing me lecture, whether you're reviewing your notes with a classmate, uh, studying, preparing for the test. Uh, it's about taking the time and knowing how to utilize the information you've taken in because you've, you've paid attention and you've focused. Okay? Some key aspects of memory specifically and how they equate to learning, attention. You know, this is not rocket science. When you're in class, when you're taking in some input, some sensory input, it's, it's very important to be attentive. You want to, you want to be able to focus on the, the material at hand to the exclusion of any extraneous noise. You know, as a professor, I always talk about the importance of, and it's silly, but you know, the students who come up and sit in the front of the classroom, you know, they, they tend to do better. They're, they're usually the better students anyway. But that, you know, they're sitting up front, there's less distraction, especially if it's a 200 room you know, auditorium, 200 student auditorium. You know, and by doing that, they're, they're less prone to any extraneous uh, noise or someone interrupting them. You know, I can't control the people in the back who are Facebooking or whatever they're doing back there. It's about paying attention and really focusing on the material. It does help. It is a key component of taking it in the first time. Motivation, it's, and it's, it's an interesting topic. Cecilia will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, as a professor, it's my naive belief that you're here because you want to learn. You know, you're not here to get your B's so you get degrees. You know, I think that's the saying some students have used in the past. So it comes down to what your motivation is. Is it intrinsic or is it extrinsic? Again, my naive outlook is that it's intrinsic. You're here because you want to learn. I do what I do because I love learning. I love le le leading this epistemological life. It's fun to me. All right? If you're here just to get the grade, to get the test, grade to get the degree, then maybe we can, we can turn you away from that ideology and have you focus more on, on the material learning and the desire to learn. More than likely, if you pick a major you're loving, that you love, that, that's going to be intrinsic anyway. And that's really our hope as educators. So when we think about memory, again, we think about how you encode information, how you, how you record it. Ultimately, information at any given point stays in a short-term store. But the key here is to transfer information long-term and then ultimately to be able to retrieve that. So on test day, you know the material. Not so much memorize it. If you've memorized it, that's fine too. But I want you to know it at a deep level, and we'll get into that later. So as, because that makes it easier to retrieve in that day, at that moment in time when you have to perform well on that test. Okay? There's a three-stage model of memory by Atkinson, and, by Atkinson and Schifrin. That kind of puts it all together, I think. Uh, so let's review that. Sensory input and sensory memory, the first part of the model. Basically, you're in, you're in the moment. You're, you're hearing my voice. You're sensing that. This is sense data. My voice is sense data right now. Right? You're taking it in. It, you're registering the immediate sensations of the moment. You might hear the echo of the AC going right now, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's sensory input, and you're always in that moment. Okay? What we hope that, especially in an academic setting, is that 
in a classroom setting, instead of just hearing Dr. Grant saying words, you're actually taking in what I'm saying and you're paying attention to what I'm saying as you're taking notes to get, to, to get this information into short-term storage. All right? And it, we'll, we'll talk a little more about short-term memory in a second, but, but when this is happening, you're, it's, it's all about getting it in and then how, what can you do to further encode it into what we ultimately want it to be, and that's long-term memory, so that one day you can retrieve it. So all these terms we're using is to get long-term knowledge so that you can easily retrieve it. Right? Somewhere in the, you know, the students who struggle, who don't believe in studying too hard, you know, they get, they get stuck in this middle part of the model. You know? But things like, I think I have it here, yeah, things like attention and rehearsal really matter. You know, it's, it's, it's all about learning at a very, very deep level. And again, I'll, I'll, re I'll review that in a second. Okay? So let's focus, let's go back a little bit on this model and just look at the short-term memory component of it. I think this will be fun. Okay. What is short-term memory? Okay. I do cognitive aging research, so I do tests like this where I measure short-term memory. And we give certain tests for that, and we, we think they're fun. Do, 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 does anyone know the capacity of short-term memory? What number of digits are we most likely to remember? Yeah. Seven. Seven, exactly. And the seven plus or minus two. That's our, that, that would be the general aptitude of someone in our, in our population. Right? There's a reason phone numbers are seven digits long. You know, we know that's, a, that's doable. Right? And we can test that. Uh, we, you, we use a test called digit span. All right? So we'll have a little, little memory exercise here if you don't mind. I'm going to say a series of numbers, and when I do, I'll stop and then I'll ask you to remember as many of them as you can recall. Okay? Let's, let's have some fun with that. You're, you're focused? All right. You ready? Seven, eight, one, two, six, four, three. How many of you recalled every one of those numbers, to, to your knowledge? What are they? Seven, eight, one, two, six, four, three. Very good. And she got them in order. All right. Was there any strategy utilized to remember those numbers, or did you just remember them verbatim? Um, verbatim, or like going through after yeah. you said the newest one, repeating all of them to myself. Okay. Uh, one, one strategy you might employ, and whether you realize it or not, is something we call chunking. Right? So a lot of times we do a phone number. We think about a phone number. We do the first three digits first. 781, 2643. Which is, as, an, as a tester, I want to be very linear. And I don't want to chunk for you. So I try and be very, very uh, specific with my numbers. But you might, you might do that. And it's innate, I think, within us. And it's something we do we don't realize we're doing. Let me test you, test you one more time. So we know 7 is the average. What's, and we know it's a plus or minus. So let's try this. A little bit, little bit more digits for you. You ready? Six, four, two, seven, five, eight, nine, one, three. Okay. Any, any takers? Anyone want to? Go ahead. I, th I think so. Um, well, let's, that, let's try. I have 6427859913. Very good. Now, if I were grading you in my laboratory, she got all the digits correct. She did reverse 5 and 8, but the fact that she got all the digits is a, is a, is a good thing, is a great sign. So she recalled all nine digits. That's a good capacity. That's good aptitude. Even though you reversed 5 and 8, she got them all. Again, I don't know if you utilize some cognitive strategy, we call them, in remembering those numbers, but the fact that you got all nine is the upper limit of what we know uh, short-term memory to be. Right? Now, we think about short-term memory as a very sh well, short-term phenomenon. Without rehearsal, if I go back to my fancy model, without rehearsing that information, you might not be recall that 15 seconds later. You know, the act of rehearsing information, i.e. studying along the way, allows you to retain information over time. So if I were to ask you again, without looking at your paper, what those nine numbers were? Six, four, two. Six, four, two, five, 
five, eight, nine, four, and three. Very, very good. She missed a couple, but in that short period of time, when I addressed my attention somewhere, somewhere else, you weren't thinking I got to rehearse these numbers. You lost two along the way, and you reversed two, even though you got those two correct. So in that short period of time, she did forget some of that information, which is why we talk about how rehearsal is very important. And rehearsal matters too when, when it comes to studying. Okay, very good. There's another test that we like to do, and this is just me being a scientist, that allows us to really think about how people think and what components of memory they're better at than maybe others. I hate to, I hate to admit it, students, this, this is going to be hard for you to hear, but there are, other pe there are people who are smarter and or more capable on certain <laughs> intelligence tests than the person to your right or to your left. Right? I don't mean to be the messenger here, but it's true. Intelligence is very variable, all right? So uh, hopefully I'm not giving you any, uh, too, any news that's too bad. We do what we call a word list, and I'm going to give you a list of words. I'm gonna, I'm, same thing, I'm going to ask you to think about them, recall as many as you can. When I, when I prompt you, write them down, okay? You ready? Let's try this. Focus on these words for me if you could. Sofa, orange, monkey, table, lemon, lion, Grape, giraffe, lamp, strawberry, cabinet, elephant. I see busy writing. This is good. Now, I'm not going to call anyone out here, but I would like you to look at the words you've recalled. I will ask this. How many of you recalled words from the beginning of that list, like sofa, orange, monkey, table, lemon? Right. Now, how many of you have these words, lamp, strawberry, cabinet, elephant? Do you, how, many did you, how many total words did you get? Nine. Nine out of 12. There were 12 total. Very good. Some of you might see that on your paper. You might have recalled sofa, orange, monkey, table, more so than you did giraffe, lamp, strawberry, cabinet. You know, th th this is called a serial position effect. And it's interesting, I think, because if I give you a lot of material like I just did, are you remembering the first part of that list at the exclusion of the, la the latter words? Or are you, you focusing on the, the first words and then, and then in an attempt to remember the last words, losing the first part of the list? We call that primacy versus recency effect. Another thing that you might have done, how many of you can recall those words? How many, can you, how many of those words can you think of that were types of furniture? Um, can you, do you remember them off the top of your head? Um, well, the ones, oh, why did you just cover my paper? <laughs> um, sofa, lamp, table, cabinet. Beautiful. Now, you utilize the cognitive strategy there. Whether you know, realize it or not, she was able to classify thematically the words that I, that I spoke. And that's another way to re recall. And, and if I'm doing this test in the lab, I'm, re I'm asking you to recall the words you can remember, but I'm also saying, okay, how many of those words were ways of traveling or types of furniture, et cetera, et cetera. And that's great that you recalled those because in your mind, maybe you were classifying them as you, as you heard me say them in terms of what they were. Right? In a lab setting, I would give you this list three or four or five more times. So by the fifth time you've heard this, word, this list, what do you expect? I would expect that you would retain, if not all of them, the majority of them. You don't have too far to go. You retain 9 out of 12, I believe. You know? and, and that fosters short-term memory. And it also is a beautiful example of rehearsal. All right? I'm, I'm, I'm making you rehearse it, but nonetheless, you're rehearsing it. And after the fifth trial, you remember more. And then I might do what I did earlier, come back 30 minutes later and ask you to read. I, ga I gave you a list of words 30 minutes ago. How many of them can you recall? and see what you recall 30 minutes later. To me, that's, a, and it is, a measure of long-term memory at this point. How much, because of that practice, because of that rehearsal, how many words could you retain and ultimately retrieve 30 minutes later back into short-term memory so you could tell me what those words were? All right, rehearsal. That was fun, right? Now we're going to focus a little bit more on the, this part of the model here, the encoding part that really takes information into long-term memory. Okay? We talk about processing or encoding to a long-term store. I really want to focus on these 
constructs, level of processing, whether it be structural, where you're encoding the visual nature of the stimulus. If you're taking notes, if I'm giving you the definition of a fancy term we use in genetics called epistasis, you're looking at that word and you're spelling it out, and that's the structural part of it. The phenomic level, you're hearing me say the word epistasis, and you, you understand you're encoding the sound of that word. I argue that until you know the meaning of that word, you're not going to be retaining information at a deep enough level. At, at, at a deep enough level right? By definition, epistasis means gene by gene interaction. So you write that down, you study it, you think about it, and if you retain that information, if you understand that two genes can interact to produce some trait, you're, you're, you're there. So a month from now, when you're having your soda with a buddy, you, know, you can say, oh, by the way, did you know epistasis was gene by gene interaction? <laughs> I'm hoping that 30 days from now you have that because you now understand what it is. It goes beyond spelling it and hearing it. You understand the word. So the semantic level of processing information is the deepest best way to learn and to ultimately remember, to know, okay? There are different types of encoding at this, at this level, whether in, it's either automatic processing, we call it, or effortful processing. Automatic processing, it's nice, yes, we all do it, but that's that, the intake of information that really doesn't utilize any of our conscious effort. What did you have for breakfast this morning? We don't have to answer that, but you know, that's automatic processing. You recall what you had for breakfast. You do, there's no effort there. You just know what you had for breakfast this morning. Effortful processing is more elaborate, more intentional. You're taking information like schoolwork, and you're trying to learn this material. And we're going to differentiate now between maintenance rehearsal. So we're going to break down rehearsal a little bit more. Maintenance rehearsal versus elaborative rehearsal. And I'll make the argument that elaborative rehearsal is the best way to go based on what we already know about understanding the semantic knowledge and as it relates to learning, okay? Maintenance rehearsal, by definition, is just that rote, mem rote repetition. So at some point, you know, 3537077, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, all right, see, it worked 30 minutes ago. An hour ago you told me that. And I didn't see it on my notes, I swear. Uh, that's the number through the ERC, correct? There you go. Rote memorization helps when it comes to things like that. You bump into a buddy on the, you bump into Cecilia after this on the way back to her office and she wants you to call her. You don't know the ERC number. She tells you 353-7077 and you're like, I have nothing to write with. 353-7077 and you say it to yourself in the five minutes it takes you to get back to your dorm. You know, again, that's rote me repetition, rote memorization, which I don't mind. But the students who employ that as a tactic the night before a test, probably aren't going to be as prepared and ready to recall knowledge, learned information, as optimally as if someone used this elaborative type rehearsal, right, where you're actually focusing again on the meaning of the information, the semantic aspect of it. Okay? And it's, uh, we know it's much more effective in, the transferring, in transferring information to long-term stores. Okay? Another example of maintenance rehearsal, you know, we think about flashcards. Now, I don't dislike flashcards. Use them. So, you know, usually you're writing a term, right, and then you're putting the definition on the back. I, I don't know how often you guys write theory out. You know, uh, more times than not, it's probably memorization of terms and, and, and some hierarchical information, and that's fine. It has its place. It really does. But again, my job today is to sell you on the fact that I want you to get to the understanding part of that, and I promise you, I'm not selling you a bill of goods here. I'm, I promise you. You, it'll make you a better student. Okay. So we're back to our model. And if I had to re reinvent this model a little bit, I'd put maintenance rehearsal here, that rote memorization, you know, and how we get things into short-term memory long enough to recall them five minutes later when we get to our dorm so we can call Cecilia at the ERC. Or, and or utilizing that elaborative rehearsal so as to further encode it into something that we can recall. And by theory, by definition, long-term memory is infinite. There's, there's no capacity there. So the sky's the limit. Your brains are malleable. They're ready for information. Keep it coming. You know, be that learned individual over time. You, you have the capacity. Right? Other things that we can use 
we can utilize when we think about elaborative rehearsal. And we're going to go in, into depth here, and I'm going to introduce, bring Cecilia back, and she's going to take over in a minute. You know, it's important to pay attention, to focus, to think about the meaning of the information you're trying to learn, to study it over a period of time, to keep it up. You know, other things you can utilize are, thing, are, are things like visual imagery. Think about what you're learning. Play, play a, a vignette out in your, in your mind. Picture what you're learning. Make it a little personal. Visual imagery really enriches memory right, because it provides that secondary type of memory code. Right? One example of visual imagery is something called concept maps that I'm going to bring Cecilia back in and she's going to talk about and explain what these are and how they might facilitate um, your memory process in an academic setting. And I'll come back in a little bit. Thanks. So when we talk about concept maps, it's really a way of illustrating what you've taken notes on. Um, it's a way, and you know, speaking of elaborative rehearsal, it's really a way to sort of engage with the material a little bit more dynamically than if you were just to be reading it on a page, right? Reading it off of a notebook. Has anyone used concept maps before? Okay, great. And so what have you noticed about how they help you organize information? Or how, how have you used them? Um, just for a lot of the classes that I've taken, it helps me connect, like, and how things flow a lot better. Um, different math concepts and stuff and how they connect to each other versus, like, other subjects and things like that. Just easier ways to get them together in my mind. And do you think it helps, why do you think it helps you have it in this, this format versus having it, um, in your notes, say, or as part of the text? Um, just being more of a visual person, like okay. having things being able to spread out on one page versus like a list of things across multiple pages. It's just an easier way of like flowing versus like stagnant note writing. Got it. How about you, Alex? Um, well, for me, when I take a test, I'm also a very visual learner. When I take a test, if I've arranged my notes in a way where I have different maps and uh, things are just organized in that way, I can kind of remember it as I'm taking a test, like, oh, that was over here and it's connected to this, or that was over there and it connects to that, so. So would you say you're the kind of person who can sort of close your eyes and envision what you've drawn on a, on a piece of paper when you yes. have to recall it later on? Definitely. Okay, so that's one of the great things about concept maps is that it's just a way of uh, a better visual way of organizing your information. Um, so here's one example, um, and it's, it can be as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. So these are two examples of, of concept maps. Now, a big factor about being a better student in, in college um, is really knowing how you're expected to learn all of this material, right? So, you know, you've taken good notes, you've, uh, you've, you've been diligent about filling in the blanks and talking to your professors and maybe rewriting your notes afterwards. But how, how do you guys think that you're really expected to learn in college? What's, what's the biggest sort of task that you have on a day-to-day -day basis in your classes? How are you supposed to come away with all the material? Anyone? You have to do the assigned reading, right? So most of, your, most of the classes are, or rather, mo your success really in a lot of the classes is contingent mostly on how much of the assigned reading you complete, how well you can connect those to the lectures that you're being a part of and the discussion sections that you're being, um, that you're participating in. So a lot of learning in college is about reading and that automatically means that you can't be on autopilot, right? You can't get away with skimming the material anymore like maybe we did in high school because a lot of learning in college is about how you apply concepts to problems. It's really not anymore about memorization, right? So. The key really is to be an active reader. And what do I mean when I say that? It means that you have to make, find something in the reading that, um, that means something to yourself. You have to visualize um, what you're reading. You have to you know, find something interesting about it and, and try to picture what you're reading. Um, think, of it as, you know, think of it as building a concept map as you're doing the reading. How does this information all relate to each other, right? You also want to think about summarizing the content for yourself. Um, how many of you guys break your reading down into smaller chunks? Does that, is that something you use? Do you want to tell me a little bit about it? I do that. I don't know. <laughs> um, just like different chapters or units and stuff, and then 
a quick summary at the end. And do you stop and take notes in yeah. your reading too? Okay, so that's, that's a great way of being a little bit more engaged with your reading instead of sort of zipping through a whole chapter and then most likely not really remembering too well what you read, right? Now, um, you also want to question your level of understanding. What we mean by that is you want to take time to summarize. You maybe want to put the highlighter down while you're reading so that you're not on autopilot and you can really um, think about how the different sections not only relate to the rest of the text, but how they relate to the, the, the material in your class or in your lecture. Um, and it's always important to think about what you might be tested on, right? What does a professor want you to come away with in this text? Why is it relevant to what you're covering in, in lecture? What might be on the midterm or final? And why is it important? So I'm going to show you a brief reading. And I just want you to take a couple of minutes to read about it and think about it. And then Dr. Grant's going to walk us through a little exercise. So if this was a passage from a textbook or chapter you're reading, uh, I've selfishly used Pavlov and Psych 101 material. It's a class I teach a lot. You know, th I think this is a good example of how we can read something and th start thinking of it, uh, thinking about the material as an active reader. If you go back to what Cecilia discussed, you know, everything we're talking about here is utilizing that elaboration we just talked about. You know, visualizing what you're reading, trying to summarize the content in your own words question your own level of the understanding of that text. And then I would say go one step further, and I tell my students this all the time, imagine the type of test question I might ask. Make up one yourself, and then hopefully be able to answer it. You know, that'll really allow you to, to, to know that you've, you've understood the material. So when you think about this specific example again, what can you do here? How can you utilize the fundamental properties of active reading, right? Imagery. Right. Hopefully you all thought about the dog and how innately he or she salivates to the sight of food. You, you think about your favorite Italian restaurant in the North End and your favorite meal. I'm doing it right now and my salivation will probably increase from that. <laughs> right. my, matter of fact, I'll, I'm going to book a reservation when I leave here <laughs> Friday night. You, know, I'm vi you visualize, in this case, that dog salivating to food, which any dog would. Right? And then I would play through vis visually the rest of that vignette and how over time the dog began to salivate just because he or she heard the footsteps of the research assistant. All right? And this is a classic example, no pun intended, of classical conditioning. Right? The idea of a conditioned, unconditioned stimulus, conditioned, unconditioned response. Right? So once we get past the visualization of this, this little vignette, I like to call them, you can summarize it. Okay, what just happened here? And you might want to put the highlighter down and, and think through, okay, what just happened here? The dog salivated at the sight of food, but in the experimental setting, over time, as the researchers kept bringing the food, they noticed that the dog began to salivate once he or she heard the footsteps of the research assistant bringing the food to them. All right? Okay, that makes sense. What's it telling me? What's the message here? Well, the take-home message is this idea that the dog salivates at the footsteps now. We've, we've conditioned a response right? where, where once it was unconditioned, a natural salivation to the presentation of food. Footsteps condition a, a response in that dog knowing he or she is getting food. It's dinner time. All right? A test question that I might make up for something like this is, in the example we discussed in lecture, the dog eventually salivated to the footsteps of the researcher. By, by definition, the footsteps of the researcher is now a, a conditioned stimulus, B, unconditioned stimulus, C, conditioned response, D, unconditioned response. And the answer would be conditioned stimulus in this case. So you've, I, and if you kept with me, I was visualizing the dog and thinking about the salivation. But now you went one step further in creating your, your, your test question, thinking more about the footsteps as being a conditioned stimulus now. Right? And if you, if you wrote that up and you were able to answer it, to me, you've understood the material and you, and you get it. 
And if you missed that question on my test, I'd be a little disappointed. Yeah. Not too disappointed. But you get the gist. So at the end of the day, again, you're learning at that semantic level. I, I, I have so many students come to me and review their tests after they take them. And when I'm looking through an exam and I'm, I'm, te and I'm going through with the student the questions they've missed, I'm looking, are they missing questions that are memorization type questions, factual questions, or are they missing questions that are really thematic in nature? In, in other words, they just didn't understand the concepts. And if they are missing more thematic than they are factual, then I'm, I'm going to have that talk with them. You need to study a little smarter. You need to spend more time with the material and you need to think about the material and understand and learn the material at a semantic level because you're missing, you're, you're missing questions because you don't understand the material, which tells me you're only studying to memorize. Right? No student wants to hear that. You have to spend more time studying. But that, that's usually the, the situation here. Okay? And we're going to bring Cecilia back and she's going to talk a little more about remembering. Okay? Great. So everyone, you've taken notes. You know, you've gone over the material like we said before. Learning the material in college really also depends on your ability to remember, right? So, and not just simply memorize though. Remembering concepts and the context in which they relate to each other is part of the learning process. And you can make really simple adjustments in the way that you read to foster better remembering. So, you know, think about what you're trying to learn. How does the information relate to the lecture topics or the rest of your reading, your discussion topics, for instance? You know, find a personal interest in the material. The subject matter itself may not be what you're passionate about, but, you know, if you stumble across an intriguing fact that results in what Professor Grant called an intrinsic motivation to continue learning the topic, what basically, once you've found something cool about the subject and you want to keep learning about it, you've found your intrinsic motivation to learn. Another great way of fostering remembering is to illustrate the material for yourself. Put it into your own words, rewrite your notes, draw concept maps, come up with a visual representation of what you read in the text. And really the most important factor about remembering is to consistently engage with the material. A great way to do that, condense your notes after every lecture, review them every single day, glance at them for a few minutes every day, take a few minutes to read through them, and think of that as rehearsing, consistently reviewing the information, and that's a great way, not just of remembering, but also of understanding. And that really leads us to a great fact about why we forget. And it basically drives home the fact that we, we, can't, we can't count on ha having learned something in a class one month forgetting about it, not reading our notes, not reviewing anything, and then expecting to remember it a few months later when you're trying to study for a midterm or a final. So this graph really is, shows the relationship between the amount of time that we let pass after having learned something and the amount that we're able to retain. And it's called the forgetting curve. Um, and it's basically an argument for studying consistently rather than cramming. And it basically proves why cramming doesn't work. Because if you think about it, if you've had notes that you took, say, in January that you have to dust off a couple of months later when you're getting ready for the midterm, how much of that material do you really expect to remember having not seen your notes for that, for that long, right? So it makes more sense to be consistent with your notes throughout the entire course of the semester so that you're really just refreshing information as you, as you add more on and you're really just, you've been rehearsing all of it the whole time. Now, another important thing to, to think about is to know what kind of learner you are. You said you were a visual learner earlier today, right? What, what does visual learning mean to you? Um, just the fact that if I see something like demonstrated in more of like a pictorial manner, mm -hmm. I'm a lot more likely to keep it like in my brain and remember it later. Um, listening to somebody lecture, I tend to like space out a little bit. So if there's something right in front of me, I can definitely retain it a lot easier. Okay. So do you do you rewrite your notes as a rule or how do you how do you manage your notes? Um yeah, usually with like a lot of my math classes, I'll take notes during lecture and then 
go through them after and rewrite them and like different equations and concepts and things like that so it sticks a little bit more. Okay, does anyone else have similar habits in class? Go ahead. If a professor uses slides, I okay. usually take them, download them, and write my notes on them. Okay. And then also write them out as an outline, and then maybe write them by hand if I want to know them a little bit better. And do you feel like that helps you sort of think about the, does it help you visualize the information yeah, a little bit so. more? Okay, you had your hand up too. Well, I just realized that when I take notes on um, a computer, I'm really passive and I can be listening to the lecture, but I'm not actually paying attention to what I'm writing whatsoever. And there have been times where I'm like, what? That doesn't mean anything, right. um, you know, because you're not paying direct attention to that. So I've learned that if I'm going to really remember a lecture, I really need to handwrite my notes from the start. And even a lot of times I'll go back and rewrite them um, on spots that aren't clear uh, okay. just to really help me remember everything, and I think when you handwrite something, it just stays in your brain a little bit better. Right. Yeah, so a lot of people are like that, right? So I, you know, I would say that there are two major kinds of learners, and that's visual and auditory. And students who identify themselves as visual learners, they tend to like concept maps a lot, right? They tend to like drawing things out, and it just makes a little bit more sense for them. They like to rewrite their notes because it's the practice, it's the act of writing it out longhand that almost you know, feels like it's just ingraining the information in you a little bit better. Auditory learners might be the students who can get away with not taking as many notes in class because they like hearing the lecture. They like, they like hearing, they, they're being told a story and they like to hear that, right? And so whatever kind of learner you are, it might not be a, a bad idea if you can to put a little mic, a mini recorder at the podium, you know, if, especially if it's gonna help you in the rewriting process later on when you did miss something that the lecturer said. And you know, remember that any speaker might be talking as much as twice as fast as you can write. So it's a good idea to have some kind of backup. And if that means um, that you're typing it out in class and you're rewriting it at home or that you're really taking your time longhand in class and just accepting that you're gonna have to go back and fill in some blanks later, whatever works for you. But it's so important to know what your tendencies are uh, so that you can really customize your notes in a way that works for you. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So I just have some tips for what to do before, during, and after any given lecture, right? Everyone knows you might want to show up a couple of minutes early. You don't want to stumble into class at the last minute um, and you know lose those first few minutes finding a pen and getting your notebook out. You definitely want to have the reading done before you walk into lecture. And why do I say that? If you've ever felt like you've walked into a lecture and it's just sort of out of context, you know, you're hearing some kind of random talk about X subject, um, and it really feels like it's just kind of floating out there, well, that's because it is out of context if you haven't done the reading before you've walked in. Part of the act of, of remembering and of learning, mostly, is to have some context before you walk into a lecture so that you're already prepared for what you're going to hear. And you already, you maybe already have had a chance to think about some of the questions that might come up or why that lecture uh, relates to the rest of the course, right? So. You want to put yourself, like Professor Grant said earlier, in a place where you're not, you're going to avoid distractions. Maybe you want to sit out towards the front. Um, maybe you know that there, there are students or noises or whatever to avoid in the back of the classroom. Um, you know, it's as simple as if you can't see the board as clearly, sit up front so you're not wasting time um, squinting and, and trying, to, trying to get a clear shot at the board. And after lecture, it's important to sit down for a few minutes and just take that time to revise your notes, and maybe you miss something that's still fresh in your mind that you can include. Um, maybe a, a peer asked a question that you thought was really interesting, and it might even show up on a test. Um, maybe you noticed that the professor was emphasizing a lot, of, a lot of different points that some of them you didn't expect. That's a great time to star things that you know you're going to look up later or that you're going to include in your study materials, right? And it's just a quick housekeeping thing that you should do. Just get into the habit of doing it every day, after every class. And that makes the rewriting process easier. And if you're the kind of student who wants to condense your notes um, and you know, build it into a, a study material pile that you're going to have later on in the semester, that's a great way of getting all your materials prepared. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about just, just some tips on how to take notes, specifically in terms of getting your notes to match basically the lecture style, right? Everyone's used to the outline style that we learned in high school the Roman numerals and then the indented letters or numbers. 
And it makes a lot of sense for most classes, especially for things that are very linear in nature, like Psych 101 might, make, might be a good class to, to take a topic style kind of notes in, where you're just building facts upon facts. But the way that you illustrate your notes on the page while you're in lecture might help you capture the information a little bit easier, might, might allow you to parse out information that you know you're going to have to emphasize in a test or in a paper. Um, a great example is the compare contrast style. Uh, for instance, if you're taking a class like comparative politics and you, you have to make a distinction between concepts, why not do it immediately on the page while you're taking the notes so that it jumps out at you, right? So instead of having to sift through long paragraphs in a notebook, it's automatically clear that there is a difference that the professor was trying to emphasize or that um, you have to be clear on come, come test time. Has anyone used any graphical notes in their, while in lecture or in discussion? Tell me about it. Well, I took a logic class this, uh, in the fall, and it, in just total like, nature of the class, you had to use graphs um, because you learn about how to use Venn diagrams and the correct uses of them. So um, it really helps to see everything. To, it just, I don't know. It just really simplifies your notes when you have everything in little categories, um, for me anyways, okay. rather than having a whole paragraph. It's easier to read, yeah. right? It's easier to pick out information. And these are, you know, none of this is really rocket science, but they're just really simple ways of, of, of just that, of simplifying your notes and making it easier to find information later on. So if you're dealing with a history class, you know, maybe you want to make something stand out and you want to draw a timeline. Um, because maybe that's, especially if you're a visual learner, maybe you'll be able to picture that timeline when you're trying to recall information that uh, was important at, you know, at, at any given point in that, in that time frame. Um, and the cause and effect style is a great way of expressing relationships between different subjects or topics. Um, in this example, you know, excess carbon dioxide leads to global warming, which may arguably have led to natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina um, or changes in climate like extreme winters. So that's just a really simple, straightforward way, and it won't take you any longer to write it this way than it will in an outline form when you're sitting in class. So, in addition to what you can do on your notes, there, there's a five-step process for studying SMARTER um, that we at the Educational Resource Center called RAPPER. And it's basically just an acronym for five little steps that we identified that you may already do on your own. Um, but we, you know, I want to show you how, how they all relate to each other. So, and this, by the way, shouldn't just happen before a test. It should be something that you're thinking about all semester long, right? What am I going to need to know? What am I going to have to take away from this class? What's the main idea, right? So where do you find information about a class that, that's, that you might need to study for a final or, or an exam, or that you might need to when you're getting your study materials prepped? Your syllabus, right? Your syllabus is the key all semester. It, it's, it tells you what the, what the objective of the class was, so in case you forgot why, why is this important again, look at your syllabus, right? What are the learning outcomes that your professor wants you to take away at the end of the term? What's the point of the class, basically, right? Why am I here? Um, so your first step is to recall the information to do a sort of a wholesale evaluation of the class. What is it that I needed to learn for this class or for this exam? Where am I going to find that information? Uh, it's in my notes, it's in my lecture notes, it's in my discussion notes, it's in my textbook. Um, it's in some of the non-required reading that I, that I did because it was interesting, right? And hopefully over the semester you've been building a condensed version of all of this where you can find everything in one place. So now you're not just, you're not looking in ten different areas, but you've got a nice neat pile of all of your notes and that's the perfect world, I know. So that's the recall process. You really have to figure out what is it that I need to know and where am I going to find that information. Your second step is to take an assessment. Where is it that I need extra help? What are some of the concepts that I had trouble with? Um, you know, if it's a final exam, what did, I, what did I do really well on on the midterm that I can maybe not, not forget about, but what I can study after I tackle the hard stuff, right? You need to plan out your study strategy. If you've been reading your notes on a daily basis, glancing at them at least, 
spending some time with them over the course of the semester, you're not going to have a 10-day study period where you're going to have to cover an entire semester of work for four classes, possibly even five if you're overloading. You're really going to be in a position where you know, you're going you're to spend a certain amount of time on each class over a course of a, a, a few days, a few weeks, and you're going to tackle the information little by little. But really, at this point, you're reinforcing everything because you've been rehearsing all the information all semester. You know, this is the stage also where you want to figure out what your study materials look like. If you're an auditory learner, why not read some of your notes to yourself into a recorder and walk around with that? Put it into your, into your iPhone or, you know, your smartphone. Um, if you're a visual person and you have to have some of these ideas pop, you have to remind yourself of why some of this stuff mattered, get a whiteboard and draw it out. Draw your concept maps out, write your notes out, put down some key terms, and still ask yourself questions. You know, your textbooks are really a great place to find questions that might show up on an exam. Most chap chapter beginnings have learning outcomes. They have um, key points that they're going to cover in that chapter. Turn them into questions. Um, get a study group together, you know. Uh, it's been proven that if you su can successfully teach someone a concept, you've mastered it. And then you prepare, and that's where you figure out what your timeline is for studying and, and everything else. So we came up with a sample calendar that we, we devised for a class um, a little while back. And we basically laid out all the, the five steps for wrapper. And we uh, partnered with the professor in this case. And we knew how many chapters were going to be covered in the final. And we also had spoken to that class um, a couple of weeks in anticipation of that, of that exam. So we were able to build a whole calendar with the topics that, that these students should cover in a specific amount of time if they wanted to be prepared for the full final. And basically what we did was we allotted a couple of hours on a daily basis where the student would prepare their notes for that chapter. At the same time, um, they were reviewing the, the chapter that they previously prepared for the, the day before. And so Really what was happening is that every single day, our, according to our plan, the student was preparing their study materials for one or two chapters at a time and spending a couple of hours on that, and then also reviewing notes that they had prepped the day before. And they were building on that review process every day. So that by the end of the two week stretch, they were doing a little bit of every chapter leading up into the exam. And that's really what should be happening all semester, not just a couple of weeks ahead of time. So that's what we call the wrapper, the wrapper roadmap. Um, and I thought that we'd, we'd wrap up by giving you a quick concept map, a quick summary of our topic here in the form of a concept map. I'll have Dr. Grant try to explain it. This is by no means ready to go to print. We just thought we'd have fun creating our own concept map of the topics we covered today. Again, I'd probably uh, work a little bit more on this if I wanted to publish it. So it's not grounded in too much theory. It's just our first pass at putting it all together for you. Um, and hopefully you have a better understanding of, of the components of memory and of learning and some of the strategies we've talked about. If you can incorporate them even in some small way, I think it'll make you better learners and ultimately better students. I love what you had said earlier about not liking to take notes on your computer. You think about the effect of note taking. Uh, students give me a hard time I don't provide lecture notes in my classes. I don't believe in it. And I tell them I do it for, for a reason, and it's a good reason, because I'm trying to help you out, the student. Again, sometimes they buy it, sometimes they don't. But it's sincere. I am a big believer in, first of all, showing up in class, hearing, whether you're visual or auditory. If you're hearing the professor talk about the material, if you're seeing the material, if you're writing, taking notes by hand so that you can quickly do a Venn diagram or a timeline. I, I call it sensory modalities. All sensory modalities are being drawn in at that particular time. You're there, you're hearing it, you're seeing it, you're writing it tactile. And all that, doing all that in that one 50 minute lecture puts you ahead of the person who decided to skip that day and he's just going to get a copy of the outline notes from a buddy. You know, they're going to have to work harder to retain and understand that information. So showing up, I think, is job one. And then utilizing some of these strategies and utilizing all your senses while you're in that learning environment is, is really ultimately the best way to go. And you think about, imagine have, ha, you having done the active reading beforehand. 
you know, and then coming to class and how hearing it, seeing it, writing it down, it just starts to all coming together. Okay? So again, this is our, our simple attempt at uh, pinpointing some of, the, some of the important processes about what it means ultimately to be, to be a, better, a better learner and to, and to study smarter. With that, I'd like to say thanks for coming, and I'll let Cecilia say her goodbyes, and uh, appreciate your time and your, and your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks. So once again, just to wrap up, um, this has been a workshop hosted by the Educational Resource Center, which is the Academic Support Center on campus. And you can reach us by email. Um, you can follow our blog at blogs.bu.edu slash erc. We're on Twitter, and we're also on Facebook. You can register uh, and check out all of our academic skills workshops on our website. Uh, and really, you can uh, register for any service we offer um, at the ERC on our, on our website. Thanks very much, and good luck.